tonight, I hope I can show you this invisible you. It's far more real than the visible you. The eternal body of man is the imagination. That is God himself. The divine body, Jesus Christ. We are his members. This is the body that is crucified on humanity. Now there's a story told in the 8th chapter of the book of Luke. And the crowds crushed upon him. And Jesus says, who was it that touched me? And then when they all denied it, Peter says, the multitude surround you. And they all press upon you. But Jesus says, someone touched me. For I perceive that power has gone forth from me. Here all the multitudes are trying to touch him, which shows that his body is the instrument through which the gift was conferred. What was the gift? If you see it in your mind's eye, multitudes surrounding one person, all trying to touch him, and undoubtedly all touch him if you think it take it physically, but they were trying to touch the spiritual man. And what was that gift? Because only one person succeeded in touching him. And he had an issue of blood for twelve years, and no one could cure it. I need not tell you in detail what it means. A woman who is hemorrhaging for twelve years Therefore, she cannot conceive. You see in this wonderful mystery that his body is essential to the act of regeneration. This I know from experience. For when I was taken in spirit into the presence of the risen Lord, there he was all love, infinite love, when I asked, or rather when he asked the question, and I answered it correctly, for well, the question was simple, what is the greatest thing in the world? And I answered love. And then he embraced me. Our bodies fused. We became one body. One body. He who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. The word touch, who touched me, means to attack to. It means to fasten to. We are told in Scripture that if a man knows the harlot, he becomes one with her. It is giving you a story without trying to spell it out so that people get offended. And here was a fusion with love. It was a creative act. One becomes one with the being. I felt no sexual act, but it far, far transcended any enjoyment that any physical sexual act could ever give to any person in this world. It transcends anything that man could conceive concerning the creative act. Who touched me? Someone touched her, and she had a hemorrhage for 12 years, and she was instantly cured of that condition, and she conceived. And he said, your faith has made you whole. Daughter, go in peace. You see, there's a body here. It's an actual body. 
And when I say that the divine body is all imagination, and that is Jesus Christ. Man's concept of imagination is so flimsy, so strange, that he can see it as a reality, far more real than anything in this world. He can see it as omnipresent, because he sees himself as a man who imagines. And here I'm imagining, and I'm standing here. But is my imagination confined to this little body? I tell you it isn't. I tell you that now, at this very moment, I could think of my friends in Barbados, London, Australia, Chicago, Cincinnati, and bring them all here. I don't have to travel. And see them all together in my mind's eye right here. I can take the being that I really am and then exercise it as I'm called upon to do it. Now here, the soul is told in Genesis. But it tells so beautifully that no one, unless he's a student of Scripture, will investigate it to see it. And the angel of the Lord wrestled through the night with Jacob. And when he saw he did not prevail against Jacob, and Jacob asked him his name, and he wouldn't at moment tell it. He touched him. And then he asked Jacob his name. And Jacob said, Jacob. He said, your name shall now be known as Israel, which means a man who rules as God. And seeing that the dawn was coming and he could not prevail against Jacob, he cut the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of his thigh shrank. Well, you'll take it literally if you do not know, and you do not have the desire to go further and investigate. What is it that is shrinking here? He said, the hollow of his thigh shrank, and then Jacob limped. Look it up and see what thigh represents in Scripture. It's the creative parts of man. The act is over, and so he shrinks. The completed act, the man is incapable then of continuing the act because the act is over. It's the creative act with God. And so he shrank. This God of whom I speak is your own wonderful human imagination. When I stood mentally on the deck of a ship, while seated physically in a hotel room in Barbados, and then with my imaginary hand, I held the, the rail. And I could feel the salt of the sea on the rail, as it always is. I could smell the rawness of the sea. And I could look back on an island where I am seated on that island in my hotel room, yet I am looking at it from a ship at sea, all in my imagination. When they tell me that I could not get out for months and months and months, for there was no room on the two ships servicing the island, and I had no concept of that, I simply knew that all things were possible to Jesus Christ. And this is before my experience of the waking within me to find out who I really am. I only knew this power could be used long before that. Well, I had no concept of such awakening until, well, only 12 years ago. And yet, as I did it, and I felt the satisfaction, the same satisfaction that I couldn't continue doing it. In other words, I was touched. I fastened myself to that ship. And then I couldn't continue in the act. To me, it seemed completed. Just like a creative act. And then I simply broke it and woke seated on a chair in my hotel room. To find in hours, I had a notice that I was going to sail on the next sailing of a ship, that ship, for the place I wanted, which was New York City. I fastened myself to it. Eventually, years later, the whole thing unfolded with English as to what really took place back in 1929 when I stood in the presence 
of the risen Lord. For now, who's still there? My body was in my hotel room in New York City. And yet, I had the sensation of motion. I stood in the presence of love. I had to be taken in spirit. And he who stood before me seemed to me as real as anything in this world, more so. Infinite love in its man. Just man. But I can't describe him, say, I will say he is the ancient of days. You can't put time on him. He's beyond time. He's the ancient of days. And at that moment when he actually embraced me and refused, a thrill beyond the wildest dream permeated my body. Well, it had to be the body of spirit because my body, as you see it now, was on a bed in New York City. Now, the word also means not only to attach to and to fasten to, it means to set on fire, to kindle, to light. And when I returned, my room was lit. No artificial light was on, and it was four in the morning. There was no full moon, no light on the outside to illuminate my room, and my room was luminous. And it did not subside, or it seemed to me, at least I was there 15, 20 minutes. It was simply luminous. You are set on fire by that union. And then, as the years go on, 30 years later, then the whole thing erupted within me, and his whole story, for he had impressed himself upon me at that moment. And this, I know, this body is essential in the work of regeneration. It is an actual creative act. Trust me. I tell you from my own experience, it happened to me. It will happen to everyone. But you will say there are billions of us. And how could it happen? Everyone incorporated into that body becomes the same being. And he becomes the one. And they become those who are used in that office. It's a peculiar mystery. So don't think one being, it is one being, but one being made up of all, as told us in the 27th chapter of Isaiah. I will gather you one by one. Who? O Israel. For Israel was the name given to Jacob after he shrank. That was the beginning. I will gather you one by one. O Israel. First of all, he has tied them in the furnaces of affliction. And then he calls us one by one by one. Each is incorporated into that one body. Each then becomes the body. Each becomes the spirit. And each is playing the part, calling us all one by one into that state. And there is an actual union that takes place. And then comes the regeneration. That comes then the resurrection of the individual who is incorporated into that body first. In a practical sense, do it as I did it on the ship, as I did it to get out of the army, as I do it whenever I'm up against something, because I've forgotten the unnumbered moments in my life when I idly entertain unlovely thoughts. And so they must come up for the harvest. They must come to confront me. And so not knowing what I planted, you're coming up. And then you'll find yourself, at that moment, you've got to do something. You always do something. For the promise is, wherever the sole of your foot shall tread, that I have given to you. So all of a sudden, news is on the horizon. Things are moving in your direction, and they aren't pleasant. Don't they? What would you do now if things were as you want them to be? Ask yourself that question. Then do it and fasten yourself to it. And set yourself on fire. And then this also comes into your world. So the inner being is real. I'll show you now how to do it how you really can prove that this 
being in you is a form, it is reality, far more real than this. There is no rose in this room at the moment, unless your name is rose, but I mean a flower. Can you detect the fragrance of a rose? Try it. You can. If you concentrate, you can actually detect the fragrance of a rose. But if the rose is not here, how can you smell it? Can't you actually feel a tennis ball? Can you feel a baseball? Can you feel the hand of a friend? You can, if you try it. They're here, because you are omnipresent. You don't have to travel for it. They're all here. Wherever you are, the whole thing is contained within you. All things exist in the human imagination. And you will say, well, now what does that mean? So I can touch the rose, and I can touch the ball, and I can touch this. Well, I am telling you, if you get yourself attached to it, you will get it. You will actually get it. Now, you can attach yourself to money. Actually, you can smell it. Money smells unlike anything else in the world. If you like it that much, you can smell it. And you can feel it. Don't ask yourself how this miracle is going to happen. For the word translated power in the King James Version is translated virtue. It means miraculous power went out of it. It also means the miracle itself. Someone touched me, for I perceive power has gone forth from me. It's a creative act. And so you can feel the rose, you can feel this, feel that, touch it, smell it, see it, and then power goes out. You're attached to it. Leave it. You will bring that into birth in this world of Caesar. The other depends upon it touching you so that you are drawn into it and then it embraces you. So here, the being in you, you can touch it right now and you can actually feel and exercise the being within you. It is your own wonderful human imagination. So let me show you how this wonderful drama unfolds. You've heard me speak here in the last month and a half, two months, of a little girl whose name is Melo. I tell you she plays the part of Peter in my drama. This past week, I received a letter last Friday night. And he said, you are in my dream. I dreamt of you, a devil, mom, dad, my sister, and me. And him six, including yourself. He said, my dad was going to be tortured by a devil. And the devil had two long horns on top of his head. And the longest tail on earth, and he had a fork, and on the fork was a picture of fire, and then he had a spoon, and your picture was on it, and under the picture was the word enemy, and I knew why. I knew that you were all loved, and everybody on earth loved you. Mostly me. He was all hate. And then my dad was tortured. It took place under the ground. He was hung on a string between two poles. And suddenly you appeared with my sister in your arms. And as you appeared, the devil screamed and faded. And then mom went over to you 
to give you a kiss of thanks. And you faded. And she went, uh. She seemed so confused. I went, uh. And then a voice said, He is what others call dead. He is what others call a spirit. He is what we call, and now comes out, the God in us. He is what others call day. He is what others call a spirit. He is what we call God in us. And then he said, I awoke. Yours truly, Melo. <laughs> now in all these wonderful visions, there's always a central point. Forget the devil, forget all these things. You can put them all together. One simple, simple thought in that when she said, mostly me, that was the entire dream. That was the entire vision. Here, she mentioned six characters, including herself. She mentions the devil, who is all hate. She mentions me, all love. And the world, everyone loves me. Because I was loved. And then my appearance caused the devil to vanish. My mother wanted to kiss me and thank me because her husband, dad, was saved when I appeared and the devil vanished. But that simple little statement, most meaning, I'm quite sure this little child is not familiar with scripture. I don't think she knows the last chapter of the book of John. In fact, two people do. It's an epilogue. For the book ends on the 20th chapter. And the 21st chapter is an epilogue. As the first 18 verses is a prologue. And the last chapter, an epilogue. And this is the risen Lord. And he appears unto the disciples. And he turns to Peter. And Jesus said to Simon Peter, Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these do? That's the literal translation. He means the others. And he answered, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then he said a second time, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me? And again he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Now the first time he said, feed my lamb. The second time he said, tame my sheep. And the third time he asked the same question. Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me? And then he was a bit irritated. So you asked the same thing three times. And said, you know all things, Lord. And you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. Here we find the parallel between the three denials of the Lord, of Peter. And the three questions, and then the three conditions imposed upon him. You feed my lamb, you tend my sheep, you feed my sheep. And here she finds, in the very last, the three states of the voice. First of all, she confesses, mostly me. Or she answered, do you love me more than these? It is not, do you love me more than you love the others? Do you love me more than these love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know I do. So she said, the whole earth loves me. Mostly me. Just like a child expressing it. And then she comes to the last and the same three. He is what others call dead. He is what others call a spirit. 
He is what we call the God in us. There's only one spirit. There's only one Lord. There's only one body. Only one God and Father of all. So the being in you is also in the speaker. And yet you're individualized. I am individualized. And we not in eternity, though we are one, will we ever lose that individuality. That identity is unique. It was not created. It's uncreated. It can never in eternity cease to be. It was not created. The being that you are. And yet, we are one. We are all one. But this inner you, that inmost self of which I speak, when he said he will transform our lowly body to be of one form with his glorious body, that union is the transformation. Then comes the regeneration, and you are not only incorporated into the body, you awaken in the body. And then you are used as the body is used, as the instrument through which the gift is bestowed. And the whole vast world is symbolized in that woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. Waiting, waiting, waiting for that moment in time when it would not be so and she could conceive. And who touched it? Lord, the multitude surrounded. And you ask such a question, they all press upon you. Some one touched me because I perceived that power, that virtue went forth from me. And may I tell you, it does go forth from me. Even in the things of Caesar, it goes forth from me. I know in New York City, when I used to have these interviews, I was just dead tired at the end of a day that I stopped them. And so I would have, say, two an hour, give each person a half an hour. I would go into the silence of each one and completely explode and feel that they had what they wanted. But at the end of the day, I was completely pooped. But it does go for something. It was a creative act with the request of everyone. And so I know virtue goes out. A virtue is power. It's creative power. It's a miraculous power. And they got what they wanted. And I got more and more tired. So I tell you, this is a power, a peculiar, miraculous power, and it's all your own wonderful human imagination. You just simply, right now, try it. You can smell the flower, you can smell the seed, but don't do it lightly, because it's going to come to pass. Don't treat it lightly. Just to disprove it, you'll be stupid because you aren't going to disprove it, and in the proving you may not really be ready for it when it comes into your world demanding recognition. That I also know from experience. So be careful what you want when you apply this principle to it. There's nothing wrong in wanting, wanting to be secure in this world. What's wrong with that? Nothing wrong in being uh, desirous of a healthy body. All these things you can have. But the past is also catching up with you. Because the present moment is not receding into the past. It's advancing into the future to confront it. And so, what I'm doing now is not really receding. It's moving forward. I'm moving forward then to confront it. So what have I done that has moved forward for me to confront it? When I get there, I have to admit it, I did do it. And if I felt sorry for myself or in anything, any way, entered into a state where I became attached to it, I'm going to confront it tomorrow. Why? Because it's being in us is a created being. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your own wonderful human imagination.
There is no other Jesus Christ. But he is buried in you because he is first crucified on you. One day he will rise in you. This is the same Jesus Christ. There's only one Jesus Christ. So the eternal body of man is the human imagination. That is God himself. The divine body, Jesus. And all of us are members of this one body. But we are gathered one by one. And we are called by that risen body, which is now incorporating one after the other. And it's called the living, living church. Not any sort of thing made with human hands. It is the body of the elect. Those who have been called, those who have been chosen, those who have been elected. And they're incorporated into that one body by a creative act. And then, in my own case, I said 30 years. 30 years later, you rise in that body. That's where you rise. And then you are part of the body. You are part when you are incorporated, but now you are living, awakened part, to be used in that capacity as the instrument to bestow the gift. For he said, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Well, grace is the gift. When the individual is completely regenerated, when that one is made equipped to receive the seed of God. Well, tonight, try it when you go home. Don't say that something is too big. You aren't doing it as Caesar. You're doing it as Jesus Christ, and all things are possible to him. So take the theme, take anything, and then become attached to it. Actually feel yourself right into the feeling of that wish fulfilled. And see what it would be like if it were true. Feel what it would be like if it were true. And you reach a certain point that you can't do it anymore. You feel satisfied. That moment of satisfaction is the act in this world of Caesar. And then it's done. And in the not distant future, you are confronted in this world. For that thing is not receiving, it's advancing into the future. So the innermost man is his imagination. And that innermost man, as Mayo said, we call it the God in us. Others call it, because they can't see you physically, dead. And others call it, believing in spirit, a spirit. But we call it, said she, the God in us. And so, how beautifully that little child fulfilled what he had to. At the very end of John, he reached it. So here, do you love me, Peter? More than these? More than they do? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. A second time, do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, you know I do. Then the third time, to parallel the three denials, and then he imposes upon Peter a condition to feed my land, to tend my sheep, and then to feed my sheep. And so she will. Many times she will blow her top as it were, for that's what Peter was. A violent character at moments, and then so tender at others, because she has the spirit in her. She'll play you play to the focus. But you brought it right down to the very end of the drama, even into the epilogue. So here I tell you, this drama is forever. Everyone's going to play. Everyone's going to be incorporated into that one body. And it is a body that no one tell you some impersonal force, like an oversoul, and a this, that, and the other. Forget it. It's a body. And how can that be a body that you're looking at it and still it is omnipresent? Well, I stand right here now. It doesn't take me a second to think of a dozen of my loved ones scattered all over the earth and put them all here. 
Oh, I could be there. It makes no difference. All things are possible to the imagination. Because all things exist in my imagination. Where must I go outside of myself to find anything if it all exists in my imagination? So I don't have to go traveling for it. It exists here. What is my need now in Caesar's world? What does it exist in my imagination? Lay hold of it. Touch it. Become attached to it. Fasten yourself to it. And set it on fire. Actually feel the reality of it. You can feel it. May I tell you, the minute you begin to feel it, it is done. Get the satisfaction, as I've always said, of all the pleasures of the world. Relief is the most keenly felt. At the end of the creative act, it is relief. Until you reach the climax, you can't, it is, there must be the climax for relief. And then, it's done. And he knew the power had gone out, for he felt it. But when they all denied it, well, can you see a scene where multitudes are pressing? How many must have touched him? But only one touched him. All the others touched the outer garment, but they didn't touch him. For he is all spirit. He is all imagination. And people are looking for him to come into place. When you meet the risen Lord, it's folly before you. As far as you're concerned, it is flesh, but it isn't. Because how could flesh embrace another being of flesh and the two become one? There is no such thing as such a union in this world of season. So I was in spirit and he is spirit. For God is spirit. And as he embraced me, the two became one. And he imprinted himself upon me. But I had then to bear his likeness by having that pattern unfold that he needs. So we are called, all gathered, one by one. So when we understand the story, the infinite drama, as it is presented in Scripture, I often wonder how these translators did such a wonderful job so as not to offend people in telling them as they told it. Just imagine wrestling through the night. And then, because he didn't prevail, he touched his thigh. And then the thigh shrank. And then Jacob, who is now called Israel, limped. And he made a mental picture of a man whose thigh shrank. And it isn't that at all. Take the word in your concordance and look up the word thigh. And you receive a shock when you see what it is. But it's much better to say thigh for those who could be offended if you actually knew what is taking place. The creative act is over and the organ shrinks. And that's the story of God and man. So here, this inner you is real. It's the immortal you. It cannot die. I don't care what happens to you from now on. You cannot die. You are this immortal, incorruptible being. And while you are here, for a purpose, in time you'll be called. You'll be called into that union with the risen Lord. And then you can come today from that union on. And it will be 30 years, so you are told in the gospel. And he began his work when he was about 30 years of age. It has nothing to do with 30 years from the time you were born as a little child. It's from the time that you actually were incorporated through that union into the body of God. And you can come to it from then on. It was 1929, all right, so I was 24. Come to 30, and you find me 54. It was when I was 54 years of age in the city of San Francisco that the whole thing began to erupt and unfold within me. So he was about 50 years of age. Now John mentions it. You know Abraham? Why? You're not yet 50. 
others were it. Why? You are just about 50 years of age. So he brings the age forward into the 50s. It doesn't matter. It could happen, say, at 40. But then you would have to go back to your time when you were 10. Because it's 30 years from the time of that regenerative act, which is a spiritual union with the risen Lord. So you, seated here, your destiny is to be one with the glorified body of God, sharing it as your own body. You are the spirit of it. For there's only then one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all. But now tonight, in the most simple, practical way, because we are still living in the world of Jesus, ask no one anything. What do you want? You ask yourself, what do I want? And then you answer quite honestly. If reason comes in, which is always doubt, it's called the devil. Well, you couldn't get there. You're either too old, or you're this, or you don't know the right people. Forget that. That's all the devil. That's all doubt. What do I want? All things are possible to God. And God is my own wonderful human imagination. But I know what I want, well then, use my imagination now, to create the scene which would imply that I have it. And become attached to it. And feel it, feel myself right into it and become one with it. And then when I feel the satisfaction of this state, I can continue doing it, because I'll reach the climax. It's done. Drop it. In its own good time, it could be in 24 hours, it could be in a month, it could be in a week, but in its own good time, it will create the means necessary to externalize itself. And you will get it. That's how it works. You don't pray to anyone on the outside, you have found him on the inside. Just as male was, but we call him the God in us. Others call, speak of him as the dead. He died 2,000 years ago. Others speak of him as a spirit. But we call him the God in us. A child, hearing a voice coming seemingly from without, is really coming from within herself. That's where she's hearing it. And all the imagery of that vision is so perfect. The old, old story of the horns on the head and the long tail and the fork. And then she said, when she saw my picture on the spoon he held in his hand and under enemy. But then she said, I knew why. Because in children she knew why I was the enemy of one who was the embodiment of hate. For I was all that. Love embraced me. And sent me. I can be nothing more done. He who embraced me sent me. He who sees me sees him who sent me. We are one. And so in, when love then appeared, her dad was saved. And he screamed. And then faded. That's what, exactly what you're told in scripture. When he appeared, the devil screamed at him. And he had no compassion on them. He still cast them out. And then they faded. Her vision was perfect. All the imagery was perfect. That simple little word, most unique. Do you love me? You know I do, Lord. More than these? You know I do, Lord. And she adds that simple little word. Most unique. Well, the child is only, I think she's now nine, from what I can tell. Eight or nine, but I think her last birthday on the 4th of January, she's nine. So you see, everyone's going to have scripture unfold within them, and they're going to have confirmation of it from those who come within their world. They're all come. They have to come. And no one can come unless my father draws them. And out of the nowhere, Peter was drawn. Not from a beach fishing, just saying her little toys. 
and yet out of that nowhere she was drawn to play the part. I've only seen the child twice. He doesn't know me, so he doesn't know me, he plays in her vision. So the body of which I speak is real. It's not some intangible thing, some doctrinal. It's solidly real, more real than any physical thing in the world, and yet omnipresent. That is the mystery. How can it be a body and be omnipresent? And yet it is omnipresent. And it's all powerful. It is defined as the power of God. Therefore, no matter where power is exercised, there is that body. It's the wisdom of God. There is that body. Whenever wisdom is exercised, there is that body. And you are that body. Your true being, your essential being, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no other Jesus Christ. 